welcome to the Coffee House, where in the next hour, has Merritt Corporation, the D.C. area's biggest polluter, gotten environmental religion? We ask former EPA Enforcement Chief Eric Schaefer. The Chamber of Commerce calls it creating a good business climate, but author Greg Leroy calls it the Great American Job Scam. In Memoriam, a look back on the life of local jazz great Keeter Betts. We'll meet Sharnice Fox, poet, filmmaker, record producer, and arts advocate. Hear poets Judith Harris, Leah Harris, and Chung Mi Kim and tune into the fiddle sounds of American Folklife Center founder, Alan Jabor, on the Coffee House. Welcome to 21st Century Life at the Coffee House. Last month, neighborhood activists in Alexandria, Virginia, knocked down a polluting power plant of Goliath proportions. The coal-fired electricity plant there, in operation since the Truman administration and owned by the controversial Merant Corporation, shut down completely at midnight on August 24th. The plant, which residents complained left a thick layer of soot dust blanketing parts of the city, was failing to meet federal air quality standards. The problem was so bad the company concluded it had no choice but to shut down the plant completely. Yet a Merant Corporation spokesperson maintained the company was completely unaware of the problem until a recent test at the plant, which begs the questions, what else does Merant not know about its power plants, three of which are nearly as old and still in operation in Montgomery, Prince George's, and Charles Counties in Maryland? Should the state of Maryland require new testing of these plants in light of the Alexandria affair? Can the regional economy survive more power plant shutdowns? My guest today is Eric Schaefer, former enforcement chief at the US EPA and now director of the Environmental Integrity Project, a power plant watchdog group based in Washington, DC. Eric, welcome to the coffee house. Thanks, Mike. Tell us basically what happened at this power plant across the river in Alexandria. Why did it have to shut down? This is virtually an unprecedented event for a power plant to shut down, isn't it? It sure is. I worked at EPA for 12 years, and I don't remember us ever confronting a situation like this. Now, Merritt's trying to make it sound complicated, but it's really pretty simple. The state of Virginia ordered Merritt to test what came out of its stacks under various weather conditions. Now, EPA sets limits on the amount of pollution that's supposed to be in the air that we breathe to protect public health. What Merrin's own study found is that their emissions would cause that level of pollution to rise 10, 15 times above the health-based standards. I know and you never see numbers <coughs> like that. The Washington Post reported that over a 24-hour period, the US EPA's health-based limit for sulfur dioxide, one of the major pollutants from coal-fired power plants, the, the acceptable limit of exposure is 365 micrograms per cubic meter of air. But the study at the Merritt plant in Alexandria found that under certain conditions, the plant releases 5,000 microgram, micrograms per cubic meter of sulfur dioxide. And this is within a heavily populated half mile radius. That's right. And that, that's about 15 times the standard. And again, you, you never see pollution level that high unless maybe you're living next to three refineries that are all operating at full capacity. So t given your experience in, in power plant uh, matters at EPA and now in your own nonprofit, um, was this the right decision to shut down the plant? Oh, absolutely. I don't think either Virginia or, or Marin had any other choice. Again, you've got a health-based standard supposed to protect us from air pollution, and you have a plant where the emissions go more than 10 times that pollution level. And um, is, it, is this affecting our regional electricity grid? Should people be concerned? I mean, is it, you know, Merritt has, you know, basically framed it as, well, we need this, the power plant's dirty, but we need it. And it's sort of like either your lungs or your lights. Yeah. You mean, yeah, will, will the lights go out? Will the lights words? go out? Yeah. Uh, I'm not an energy expert, but the people who manage the grid for the metropolitan area say we have plenty of power. Now, there are scenarios where if uh, a whole bunch of 
contingencies line up. If a lot of bad things happen at once, mm -hmm. we might have a temporary shortage, but that's a very, very remote possibility. And the lights haven't gone out yet. We haven't heard of any complications whatsoever of this power plant. No, the lights seem pretty bright here. <coughs> I don't think we have a problem. Well, Merritt owns three other power plants, not just the Alexandria plant. There are the three, one's in right. Montgomery County, one's in Prince George's County, one's in Charles County. They're almost as old as the Alexandria plant. Should they shut down too? Do we need testing? How do we know that these aren't as polluting as the one in Alexandria? You were talking about how old these plants are. If we're going to date them by by presidents, I think you said Alexandria was Truman era. Right. The Dickerson plant in Montgomery County is Eisenhower mm -hmm. era. That was built in 1959. <coughs> Very old. Now, you, you did have an unusual situation in Alexandria. The stacks are short. The smokestacks. The smokestacks at the plant are very short. You've got some tall buildings close by the plant, mm -hmm. and that combines to, to trap the pollution and, and drive up the pollution levels in the neighborhood right around the plant. Mm -hmm. In Maryland, the power plants all have much taller stacks. But one thing I want people to hear is, while, while that may not that may mean that you don't have high pollutant loadings right next to the plant. It doesn't cure the problem because the pollution is driven up the tall stack and then scattered over a big geographic area where we end up with more sulfur dioxide, more fine particle pollution, and the problems that come with it, asthma attacks, so heart ultimately, disease. So ultimately it's not the height of the stack, it's that these are old plants and they're burning pulverized coal. That's right. Without controls that we've required of new plants for at least 30 years. So what do we do? I mean, there's seven yeah. old plants like this in Maryland. What do we need to do? Clean, clean them up. It's way past time to clean these plants up. Again, I, I mean, I just ask your uh, listeners to think about a power plant built in 1959 that has never really tried to control its sulfur dioxide emissions, has never put on a scrubber, which is what you use in a modern plant to try to reduce sulfur dioxide pollution. They've been getting away with that now for almost 50 years. It's, it's way past time to I'm, clean up. I'm trying to think of, you know, what if we were all driving automobiles from the Truman administration right. or Eisenhower administration and hadn't yet gotten a tune-up? Right. Um, the, air, the air would be unbelievable. So what do we need to do? Now, the federal government has been dragging its feet in yes. many ways. That's one of the reasons you resigned from the US EPA right. as a whistleblower. But the, my understanding is the Clean Air Act, the US Clean Air Act, explicitly grant states the power to regulate power plants. Right. So, That's for example, what should Maryland do? Right. Maryland should use that authority and crack down on these plants. I mean, Maryland can do a couple of things. Maryland can improve emissions monitoring, no question. We, we need to learn more about what's coming out of these plants and, and the effect it can have on our health. But that shouldn't be used to delay cleanup because we already know plenty about what comes out of Merritt's plants in Maryland. We know they cause an awful lot of fine particle pollution in our state. And again, that's linked to asthma attacks and heart disease. Uh, we've got scientists and doctors at Hopkins in our own state who will, at Hopkins University, Johns Hopkins, who know a lot more about it than I do and, and, and can have gone on the record about the problem. And there's mercury. I know that, that I was involved in a campaign to test elected officials in Annapolis last winter for mercury, uh, high levels of mercury, and that's we actually right. took hair samples from 20-something elected officials, and a third of them had elevated mercury levels in, in their bodies. So right. this is a real problem. It sure is. The Centers for Disease Control, federal agency, says 10% of women of childbearing age have more mercury in their bloodstream than is considered safe. And that's a problem because mercury is very toxic to fetuses and to nursing <coughs> infants. Well, what about companies like Merant Corporation? Um, say they can't afford it. Y you know, yeah, that technology exists, but we're talking about uh, the core of our electricity production in this region. Uh, if they if they adopt the, the the most effective latest technology, they'll they'll go out of business, or or it energy is. prices will skyrocket. We, is that true? Yeah, we've been hearing from the power industry since the Clean Air Act was born in the mid '70s that they can't afford it. It's always that they can't afford it, and yet somehow we struggle through. They can't afford it. it give you a couple of numbers. The White House Office of Management and Budget, this is George Bush's crowd, says that every ton of sulfur dioxide costs the public health more than $7,000. So every, we pay 7000 bucks a ton for the sulfur dioxide these plants put in the air. You can clean them up 
for $500 a ton, less than 10% of the damage they do to public health. So why doesn't it happen? I mean, what's, what's stopping it? I mean, in Annapolis last year, we had a poor pollutant bill, now called the uh, Healthy Air Act, right. um, and it didn't go through. What, what's the holdup? Yeah, the, first of all, and I think most people probably understand this already, the power industry never, ever does anything unless it has to. The exceptions are there, but they're few and far between. So we need rules and regulations that require these plants to clean up. We can enforce the laws we've already got. Maryland needs to do a better job there. We can look to the US EPA, but the Bush administration has them in a stranglehold, and they're not really going to crack down hard on the energy industry. Or we can pick up the cause in Maryland and pass our own state law to get these plants cleaned up. Other states have done it. It's not that hard. Well, what about, uh, Merritt says that people like you, the, the activists, are really just trying to shut them down because you have an agenda to basically get rid of dirty fossil fuel and bring in your own preferred solar and, and wind power. Is that true? I mean, do you, do you think the answer is really to shut these power plants down? Or yeah. can you clean them up and have them? Yeah, I think most of these plants, if Merritt will make the investment, can be cleaned up and can operate with much lower pollution levels than what we've got now. Some of them, frankly, the Alexandria plant might be a good example, may have gone beyond their useful life. They may be so old and so dirty that it's time to look to alternatives. But to turn this into a, 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 an issue about turning off lights or shutting down the power industry is, is silly. It's what we hear from the lobbyists all the time, and that's not the choice we face. Uh, I know that one of the major pollutants coming out of these power plants, these four Merant power plants that literally encircled the District of Columbia is carbon dioxide, which is the principal greenhouse right. gas. Um, every day, these four power plants generate carbon dioxide equal to 700,000 Hummers driven completely around the Beltway. And I know that the same legislation in Annapolis would actually reduce the carbon dioxide um, through efficiency at the plants or allowing the power plants to buy offsets, buy uh, carbon dioxide credits elsewhere, and also planting trees. I is, that, is that something that other states are looking at? Is this something that we need in Maryland? Uh, we absolutely need some curbs on global warming gases in Maryland, and we can manage it in this state so that it doesn't come with an economic shock to our ratepayers. It can be done, and other states are looking at it, sure. Uh, after the hurricane in, in the Gulf, and you know more about this than I do certainly, I, I don't think we have a choice but to take action and, and do something about pollution that's, that's literally changing our weather. Right. Well, uh, big thanks Eric Schaefer for joining me to talk about the now idle Alexandria power plant and the implications for the future of coal-fired electricity across Maryland. Sometimes with enough public pressure, even mighty polluting Goliaths fall. With the future help of watchdogs like Eric Schaefer, we might one day have an electricity grid clean enough and safe enough that citizen activists can finally put away their stones and their slingshots. I'm Mike Tidwell, and this has been 21st Century Life here at Coffee House.
Welcome to Work Life at the Coffee House, where we're going to talk about how to attract good new jobs to our community. We all want them, so it's hardly surprising that local governments are offering significant incentives to entice employers to move into the neighborhood. Good for the community. Good for companies. A win-win situation, right? Not really, according to Good Jobs First Director Greg Leroy. He lays out his case in the new book called The Great American Job Scam. Greg, thank you for joining us again at the Coffee House. Good to see you again, Fred. So, everybody does want good jobs to move to their community. So it's hardly surprising that communities offer significant incentives to get people to move into their community with good new jobs. What's wrong with that? Well, it's gotten too expensive and it's too ineffective. The average state allows localities to subsidize jobs more than 30 different ways now. It costs states and cities more than $50 billion a year. But when you break down cause and effect, there's a disconnect here. We think and conclude that most of these breaks, these tax breaks, property tax abatements, corporate income tax credits, really don't matter. They're, they're a microscopic cost factor to most companies, dwarfed by the business basics. But if everybody, if all these communities are competing by offering more and more lucrative tax incentives and so forth, are you saying that a community can just sit it out and really expect that a company is going to move into the neighborhood? I think they can, and certainly history tells us that that's possible because more than 99% of a company's cost structure is not state and local taxes. It's skilled labor, it's good infrastructure, it's proximity to suppliers and customers, it's access to key inputs, whatever those are, electricity or water, or freight airports or research and development laboratories. That's what companies really use when they decide where to expand or relocate. But don't they also like the incentives? I mean, those things, sure, they make sense, but... They like incentives because the a system has grown up over the last 30 years, a rigged system that allows companies to extort uh, and play places against each other to pull down big tax breaks and big incentives, even though it doesn't really matter. Even though they usually, they often, I'll say, know ahead of time where they want to go, but they'll set up a rigged game, a, an auction, if you will, among several cities to play one against the other to up the ante, even if they've already made up their mind where they want to go. So it sounds like you're saying that communities don't really need to do this and can get the jobs. And if that's true, why are the communities doing it? It seems like from your book, uh, it's pervasive. Everyone's doing this. And if, it, if it's not necessary, if you, can get a, if you can get good jobs without doing it, why is everyone doing it? They're doing it because, like I say, the system has been rigged in a way to manipulate public officials, to, not, to keep them in the dark, to prevent them from understanding how companies really decide where to expand or locate. The corporate decision-making process remains a black box and public systems, frankly, are demeaned and degraded by the system. I train public officials. They know they're getting gamed. They hate this game. They would never have written the rules this way. They'd love to get out of the game. So how do they get out of the game? What should they be doing? Well, first of all, they should enact uh, safeguards. We talk about safeguards like disclosure, uh, annual company-specific disclosure of costs and benefits of every deal, clawbacks or money-back guarantee language to protect taxpayers. If a company fails to deliver, it has to pay the money back job quality standards, that is wage and health care rules, full-time hour rules, so that we're not subsidizing low-road employers like Walmart or McDonald's and then subsidizing them through the back door through Medicaid and children's health insurance. Um, other safeguards like that we think can go a long way toward just getting a lot of bad deals out of the trough. Well, okay, that, that pre prevents the bad deals and that uh, makes sure that when they come in they actually produce on what they say they're going to produce, but how does that help you get them there in the first place? If you're going to hold them more accountable, if you're going to make them disclose more, how does that address the, the incentive to get there in the first place? Well, that really goes back to cause and effect. And the truth is, because taxes are such an insignificant factor in company decision making, the best thing a, a community in a state can do to attract and retain and grow existing good businesses is to continue to have a good school system, a good infrastructure, a good vocational education and adult training program. Those are the things that matter. And let's remember, small businesses create most of the jobs, and they're, they're not gaming the system. They're not the ones with the accountants and the lawyers and the consultants to game the system. But they do depend a lot on having a good skilled workforce and a good infrastructure system. We should set up a system that's fair to small businesses, too. Well, are there some examples out there? I mean, your book has one. It's just rich <laughs> with all of these stories. Tell us about some of the stories where 
you know, it worked the way it should work, in mm -hmm. your view, and, and you didn't have to bribe the company to move in. A great example is out in Idaho, uh, then Governor Cecil Andrus in his memoirs recounts meeting with David Packard of Hewlett Packard about a new plant that the company was uh, considering to locate either in Idaho or in Oregon. And Packard, after hearing about the virtues of Idaho, said to Governor Andrus, well, what are you going to do for us? What, what, how many tax breaks do you have? And Andrus rebuffed him quickly. He said, look, you know, we just don't do special favors for newcomers. And after you've been here for a little while, you'll be an old hand, and you wouldn't want the Johnnies come lately getting a special deal that you didn't get either, would you? In an awkward silence, and then Packard said, yeah, maybe that's a good way to go. And he located a good, successful plant in hmm. Oregon, I also, in Idaho, rather, in Boise. I cite the case of North Carolina, which until about nine years ago had a very stingy regimen, which they didn't do gold-plated special deals, and they uh, stressed a uh, good workforce, a good university system, good roads, and it worked for them. They had a high growth rate, a low unemployment rate. Um, they lost a couple of trophy deals and, and started going down the slippery slope, but they were well served by a stingy, even-handed approach before. Okay, what about, let's bring this a little closer to home here in the Maryland, D.C., Virginia area. Does this go on? Do, do we have these kinds of concerns here? Are there some examples that you could tell us about uh, where this kind of ruthless competition went on and, and what was the effect? Certainly, we had a very high profile case back here between 97 and 99 with Marriott International threatening to relocate its corporate headquarters, the almost 4,000 jobs from Bethesda in Montgomery County across the river to they looked at several locations in Northern Virginia. Uh, they ended up getting a subsidy package worth at least $44 million, maybe more than $70 million from the state of Maryland and from Montgomery County to be retained. But as I said in the book, many people were skeptical at the time that Marriott was really serious about relocating. And the files, both the Virginia and Maryland state files, indicate that the public officials were also skeptical. Well, is anything going on? Um, in this area uh, to, to address this, to address these concerns? Is uh, the Maryland, anybody? Yeah, absolutely. In Maryland, the Maryland State AFL-CIO, together with a nonprofit group in Baltimore, the Job Opportunity Task Force, has been very aggressive promoting an accountability bill in Annapolis for disclosure that would go a long way toward opening up this process and getting taxpayers a lot more information. It would also add clawbacks or uh, money-back guarantee safeguards, and uh, we think that would go a long ways toward opening up the process. So again, opening up the process, but what about bringing in the good jobs? <laughs> well, let's remember, Maryland uh, is a good state in terms of uh, stressing good schools and good infrastructure. We've also benefited from a lot of federal investments in things like the National Institutes for Health that have helped spin off a lot of biotech companies in this part of the state. You know, we're a poster child here for the value of public investments helping create good private sector jobs. I think that's what we ought to keep doing. So we, you think we can do it in Maryland and, and in Virginia and in the D.C. area, that we have, this, we have the infrastructure here to attract and we don't need to oh. uh, have incentives? They, is, they will come without the incentives? This is such a highly attractive market for so many companies. It's such a major, it is already, uh, obviously in, in Northern Virginia as well, a major high-tech employment center. Companies attracted by the possibility of lucrative federal contracts, the spinoffs, the Internet spinoffs, the high-tech cluster, in Loudoun mm -hmm. County and uh, out by Dulles. Those, those are classic cluster economy stories where companies are locating there because there's lots of skilled engineers and software code writers and programmers who, are, who have the skills those companies need to thrive. Those companies need to be next to each other. America Online turned down a big subsidy package to relocate a facility down in Georgia because they wanted to keep their skilled workforce close to each other in Loudoun County. So, but what about Georgia and what about the <laughs> other places? Uh, is it true that some places you need to do this, but we don't, or do you, is it your, your sense? I mean, I, I don't think anybody's ever served by giving loose change, loose cash away to companies to just do what they want. Tragically, if you look at the states that pioneered some of these subsidies, states like Mississippi, South Carolina, the states in the South that even in the Depression began this, they're still very, very much ranked at the bottom in terms of per capita income and uh, other measures of uh, well-being. They mm -hmm. didn't, they didn't capture the long-term value of those investments. They didn't improve their goods to raise long-term living standards. Right. I thought it was very interesting in the book that you talk about the kinds of jobs that these incentives tend to attract are not the good jobs, that they're the more marginal jobs, they're the, they're the less. To the extent that these incentives work at all, they work to attract uh, marginal kinds of employers with 
who produce not really very good jobs. I mean, is that still the case now? Too often, what we've been taught is a good business climate is actually just a, a good deal for a very small sliver of companies, marginal companies that are very sensitive on, you know, to uh, cost, labor costs and, mm -hmm. and overhead costs and things like that. But that's not most of the economy. It's not good jobs. It's not long-term jobs. It's not the kind of jobs that you really grow a strong economy on. Mm -hmm. But it still goes on. I mean, this still goes on. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the number of subsidies enacted by the states continues to rise. Right. And I mean, the book was incredible in the, the, the breadth of all of these stories. It, it, <laughs> I mean, just story after story. I mean, could you quantify this at all? I mean, to what extent? You know, what, what, are, what is the level of resources that is going into these kinds of what you claim to be dysfunctional incentives? Yeah. I think a very high percentage of the of the nine of the fifty billion dollars plus a year spent by states and cities is just plain out wasted uh, you know mm -hmm. it's it's hard to put a, a, an exact precise percentage number on it but m m by far the most three quarters ninety percent because it's paying companies to do what they would have done otherwise that's what the, the evidence overwhelmingly shows mm -hmm. so it's not worth it. You say it's wasted, but someone's getting, I mean, someone's benefiting from this money, but it's not, it's not the communities that need the jobs. The big picture is that what we're really doing is transferring the burden. We're shifting the burden for the cost of public services away from large companies that have the ability to play states and cities against each other. And we're shifting that burden onto small businesses, onto homeowners, onto wage earners. And we're also just undermining the quality of our public services. What community today isn't complaining about school classroom size being too big or after school programs being curtailed or potholes mm -hmm. or road lanes that need to be widened. It's because of companies paying a, a much smaller share of the burden for public services now that our public goods are declining. Well, thank you so much, job scam author Greg Leroy, for joining us on Work Life. Once you finish this book, which I have to say is very readable and very entertaining, you will be forced to wonder how much longer we can afford to ignore the perverse ways governments are allowing corporations to get richer at the expense of sensible development policies. I'm Fred Feinstein, and this has been Work Life. Looking out the window upstairs in my room, the color of the bush down the road caught my eyes. The light flesh hue of the weedy branch, the very same color of my dress long ago. When I was ten, my mother made me a dress. Out of silk, she dyed the very same color for the August full moon harvest day. I remember the sleepless night waiting for the dawn. I wore it once and never again. The war like a wind came and stole everything, everything for a mound of ash. The dress in the light flesh hue of the weedy branch never found me alive since then. Can you see me, Kita? The light on him, dear, on this one. <laughs> Thank you.
Welcome to Writer's Block at the Coffee House. You thought you were busy. In addition to publishing two books of poetry, our guest today, Sharnice Fox, works as a filmmaker, record producer, and membership services coordinator of Americans for the Arts. Her most recent book of poems is titled Hindsight, Moments on the Couch. Sharnice, welcome to the Coffee House. And Thank you. I guess you need a couple of moments to sit down after doing all that. Um, <laughs> nah, I, I don't sit down. Yeah, I can tell. I think that energy just sort of uh, runs through your work. Uh, I, I asked you, and I'm, I'm glad you, you agreed to do this, uh, like Dick Clark used to do on American Bandstand, to, to uh, do a favorite of mine. And uh, one of my favorites in your book, and there are many, is the, the first poem. And if you, could, uh, if you could get us started by reading that, I'd, well, I, I too would be very happy. I know our, our viewing <laughs> audience will be as well. Sure, it's called um, Skeleton, West Virginia, 1952 to present. Shotgun house number 95, coal miner's daughter. Dirt roads, lunch pails, cold dust. Outhouses, clothes pens, rusted cans, burning trash. Railroad tracks alongside Route 1921. Old church on dirt road. Bake cells, children's choirs, revivals. Plastic covered couch. Polished silver rocking chairs, burnt feet walking across floor furnace, wiping coals from eyes early morning, picking apples, two purposes, breakfast and ammunition for slingshots aimed at neighborhood girls, lightning bugs, mason jars, checkers, frogs croaking, Mrs. Smith hollering from screen porch at Chucky, running with his slingshot, switches pulled from weeping willow, soaked overnight for welts across bare legs, trading stamps, tire swings, company store, Coca-Cola from glass bottlenecks, sewing machines, patchwork, and grandma's quilts. Everything covered in soot. Then the mines closed. A town becomes its nickname in the future, Skeleton Town. One shotgun house leans facing trains. A superstore, bookstore, and restaurant go up. The willows weep with the children back when, as the remains are cloned, America. Oh, thank you. Uh, I have I have a million questions for you, but of course only a limited bit of time. But I right. I do want to address a few things which um, I think come up constantly in your book and, and consistently in, in, a, in a wonderful way. Up uh, and one of them is the ability to uh, to quote Amiri Baraka. You've got that. Uh, he said that poetry was among other things speech music, and I think you really capture the you know the lyrical essence of language. But uh, You've got something to say, which, you know, I mean, there are a lot of poets out there, and all due respect to you, Bards. Uh, you know, sometimes they go on and on and on. And, but um, I think, like, well, not like a good poet and a good musician, you seem to know when to stop. And, you know, this is something I, I guess I'd start by asking you how do you know when a poem is finished? Um, in, I never, in 10 words or less. No. <laughs> I never actually, I don't know, but I do know that I try to say as little as possible in everything that I do. I, mm -hmm. I want every single word to count in a poem, mm -hmm. and um, I don't need to repeat myself. Um, and that's not something I ever actually took a class for, or it's just, I, I, I read a lot. And mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a reader who, you know how you read a novel and they over explain something, and I'll skip the pages. like. So I think that that's why I, I kind of know when to stop. Like I just know enough is enough, and I, every word is supposed to mean something. So that's pretty much how I do it. Uh -huh. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if only it were that easy for the rest of us. Uh, but yeah. now, are you? Um, I know you work with musicians. How influenced by music are you as as a writer? Uh, big. I, I listen to music as um, as I write anything. I grew up in a household. I'm an only child, and my parents were both heavily involved into music. My mom. Um, she used to sing. My father played the guitar. Mm -hmm. um, I never actually picked up an instrument. I did play the drums in band. But I mean, mm -hmm. I listened as a child growing up in the 80s where most people listened to hip hop. Being from West Virginia, that wasn't something we really listened to. My parents weren't into hip hop, and it mm -hmm. wasn't like you had um, a major radio station. We listened to country music. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. uh -huh. So, you know, in my house, Sun Ra was playing. Um, oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people Another my country. age. Another country. Exactly. Another kind of country my music. age don't even know what that is. Or Miles <laughs> Davis or John Coltrane. Matter of mm -hmm. fact, um, my production company is called Straight No Chaser. A lot the of my Thelonious friends. Monk composition. Exactly. Right. And oh, everybody yeah. thinks that my friend's name, I, that I named it after, you know, because we drink it. You were at a bar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but it's completely Thelonious Monk. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah, music definitely plays a big, a big thing in, in my writing. To, to what extent now? Because again, I, I think the, just reading your poems, and, and mm -hmm. this, is, this is something else I wanted to address because of your, your work as a, quote, spoken word artist. And, right. and for the, the middle-aged, slightly befuddled <laughs> people in the audience, uh, maybe I'm the only one, so <laughs> I, I apologize to you all What's the who are kind of wondering what the difference is. But, um, you know, you, you really pay attention to 
not only the right word, but I mean, how, how conscious are you of the sounds of language? I, I think the answer is, is probably obvious, but just to hear what you talk about. I'm that very conscious. I like the way that words roll off of my tongue, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I really think about, I, I'm a big thesaurus user, and I, and I oh. like to compare mm -hmm. different words and see where they, they fit in, in any poem or short story or whatever I'm writing. So, yeah, I'm very conscious of how they sound and how they fit together and, and the rhythm and the, and the way that they move together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what kind of, st but I think painting pictures, you know, with words as opposed to, yeah, that's, that's always mm -hmm. my goal, so. You familiar with Sterling Brown? He was, he was Poet Laureate of Washington. I've heard the name before, but I haven't read his poetry. He said a poet's uh, best friends were the dictionary, the thesaurus, and the trash can. So yes. you you get yeah. Yes, the delete button for me. Oh yeah. Yeah, see that yeah, so back then that was the you know, the <laughs> old school button. delete button. Yeah. Right. Bank it off the bank it off the back there. Yeah. Um but let's go into this your um not not to, to separate these things or pigeonhole you, but the the uh your spoken word uh role or your your crown as a spoken word person. It just again, kind of briefly, but tell us what, what the distinctions are for you or, or maybe there aren't any. I don't know. It's really hard for me. To, to define the two just because I am a writer's writer. A lot mm -hmm. of people call me a poet's poet. Um, not because I do spoken word and I do get up in front of an audience and I will perform, but it's not um, how most spoken word artists are. I don't necessarily um, try to relate to an audience. I write mm -hmm. and um, I'm very conscious of what I'm writing. I'm looking for structure, even if it's in free verse. I'm mm -hmm. c c conscious of the words. And I think spoken word artists sometimes, and not all the time, but sometimes right. are journal entries and they're just like ranting and raving, and I, I don't do that. Um, I try to tell a story at every single turn with my pen, so it's a little different for me. Um, but I don't know that there is a difference at the same time. Like saying that, I think that everybody has a right to express themselves, sure. but I just don't think that you should necessarily be called a poet. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I take offense to that, because mm -hmm. that is a craft, and that's something you're supposed to study. And if you want to have an open mic and discuss poetry or discuss what's going on in your life that's fine sure but there is a difference and, and mm -hmm. you do need to study it and, and kind of you know become familiar with the different structures I, I agree yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, do, do you think that is there a difference in the way you present say if, if uh, you were at like the Folger mm -hmm. on Tuesday and then you were at uh, say a club at U Street on Wednesday night do you do you have a different way of yes or, or is it just you know I gotta be me like Sammy Davis Jr. most of the time I have to be me there is one difference, um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little story. I wrote this poem as a joke with uh, my friend who happens to be the 2004 National Slam Champion. She's from D.C., uh, International mm -hmm, Slam Champion, mm -hmm. um, Sonia Renee. And we were on the phone, and I was joking about um, this relationship that I was in. I was like, these people drive me <laughs> nuts. And so she was like, you need to write it down. You need to write it down. And so I named the poem. It's called Uncovered, and it's like all the, it's just really, really funny. It's a mm -hmm. funny poem. And I wrote it as a joke, and it has become like my signature piece at open mic uh, venues that mm -hmm. I would never perform if I was at the Pulsar's Theater or the Kennedy <laughs> Center. Well, so, Shakespeare thought love was funny too, though. I don't know. <laughs> so, I mean, from that standpoint, yes. I mean, I would never, I don't think that Skeleton West Virginia would be a poem that someone at like Mango's or, mm -hmm. you know, Mocha Hut would, would enjoy. Um, but I do try to, there's a poem in my book um, called Liquid Joy that I do try to read mm -hmm. um, as often as I can other places, which wouldn't be considered a, a spoken word piece at all. Sure. Before um, before we have to, to sadly end our segment, talk a bit about the CD that you uh, you just put out though. I think oh yeah, we um, we have a CD called Fusion, a blend of spoken word and music, mm -hmm. and um, it, ha it has myself on it, Thirteenth of Nazareth from DC, um, Malcolm Jamal Warner, also known as Theo from the Cosby from Show. From the Cosby oh, Show, yeah. yeah. Um, uh -huh. Poetry, who's a two-time Tony Award-winning poet mm -hmm. um, from Broadway, from Deaf Comedy. Oh sure. Yeah, oh, I mean Deaf Poetry, and it's a really good um, mix of spoken word, poetry, music. It's a nice blend. I'm actually quite proud of it because a lot of times spoken word CDs tend to just be a lot of people talking and it right. has like it has a really nice jazzy feel. Ainsley Barrows from DC at the sure. New Yorican is on it. Mm -hmm. It's a really good mix. You like so. working with musicians? Right? Yeah, I do. Yeah. It's yeah. a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. So. I can imagine. Um, I'd like to get you to read one more poem before uh, before we close the segment. I'd sure. sure. Um, Let's see. I don't even think I really need my book. Being the spoken word artist that I am, I'm going to go ahead <laughs> and which, start. Whichever, whichever yeah. hat you want to wear to close um, <laughs> it. This is a song, the poem that I wrote for my sons. Um, so, it's called Headlights. He told me to watch out for white lights. So now I look for dreams around every corner, wondering how children learn fear, how you become scared to die. But at three, 
I was never scared to fly, never scared to try, never wondered why things never went my way. I just took the doll from the little girl, cause it was mine, now. Never mind that she had it first. Now, I teach him how not to take what isn't his, reprimanding his spirit so that he can grow to be a man. Cause after all, you were only three once, and 25 for 20 years spent regretting, scared that that one moment that could have changed your life forever, you didn't take flight. He told me to watch out for white lights, so now I look for angels around every corner, wishing I remembered the language of teddy bears. Me at three, I could fly over rooftops, daydream of butterflies dancing with pixies, go to sleep every night and meet myself again for the first time. I will lie to him, teach him to be scared of dreams, to close his eyes in the face of angels humbling, to face his demons belittling. Indirectly, I will show him more of what he cannot do than what he can. I will clip his wings to trade for a three-piece suit and a 401k plan, planning to die too scared to live. He told me to watch out for white lights. So now I look for angels around every corner, passionately seeking life through the eyes of a child. Thank you. I, I think you're, you know, anyone who can talk about Jim Morrison, white lights, uh, <laughs> the family in such a wonderful way, such a, a structured lyricism is, is someone who's made poetry uh, you know, accessible and, and kind of delicious, for want of a better word. Oh, so thank you. thank you so much. Thank, um, you. thank you so much for coming. Um, Writer's Block, we'd like to thank Charnese Fox, author of Hindsight Moments on the Couch. I'm Reuben Jackson. This is Charnese Fox. And uh, this has been Writer's Block at the Coffee House. Tinsel wings snipped out of horsehair, head concealed in its helmet, emerald thorax, the compound eye exquisite in its glass fear, all luminous nymphs or naiads, hatched not from larva but a thin filament drop at the stream. They are beautiful, I say, not knowing the real from the fake, from bug-like nymph stage to dun, rainbow to spinners, all names that ring like a bell, brown drake, blue-winged olive, yellow miller, black ghost, coachman and mayflies, eggs reborn, bursting, dodging like microscopic miniatures of man's first flying machines, pinions flapping on arm, sailing up over treetops, foredoomed as winter's only lightning bug, flecks of snow hitting the pond's surface, then ebbing one by one, what counterfeit jewels, a little tarnished from the wear and tear, now housed in a tin box like sampled candies, feigning sleep as frozen statues do, rested in the shim sham stillness of the summer heat, just catching the rust of sunlight on the brittle hinges of their spidery legs and paintbrush tails. I think of them all as sudden masterpieces and then seem to nudge them irresistibly as if to shock them from the airy airlessness of some human dream as if they were not so frail or waterlogged that from all this molting, colliding and diving only to rise again each time from the dead.
Well, that was a nice, nice start to a about to be a great show. Welcome to the Coffee House, uh, Alan. Thank you, Dave. Great to be pleasure, here. Pleasure, pleasure to have you. What was and the name of that tune? So that's a tune. It goes by different names. Uh, uh, one name for it is West Virginia Highway, and okay. I like that name because I hung out a lot in West Virginia and spent time with West Virginia musicians, and so West Virginia Highway sure. somehow speaks to um, me. And the author of the tune? Nobody knows. It's one of those tunes that came from the late 19th century. It's sort of a, if it's not ragtime, it, you can smell ragtime a-coming in it, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and uh, it's a country rag, I'll call it, and it just floated around with different names. I learned it from Henry Reed, but also from another fiddler called Frank George, and there was a great recording of a Blue Ridge fiddler who played it from the 20s, and so, I don't know, my version sort of right. stitches them all together. Now, you had a pretty interesting career in that uh, you got to truly say, well, I liked what I did. You were a director of the American Folklife Center. That's a fact. Uh, mm -hmm. Which is a part of the Library of Congress. Right. And how many years? I was there for 23 years, and I was actually, I did an earlier stint at the library and right. another folklore job, and another job at the Arts Endowment also dealing with folk arts. So I spent my federal career right. in folk arts. People so, keep saying, how do you get jobs like that? Right. Uh, but now, all how, this, how did you get there originally? That's a good, good... Well, the archive which brought me there first ah. was there since the 20s. Okay. And I actually, my professor in graduate school played me these Library of Congress recordings right. from, from the 30s of Alan Lomax's documentation sure. and stuff like that. And, and so I, when I started hanging out with fiddlers, I was also studying fiddling. And so right. I went to the Library of Congress for comparative understanding of where all this came from and yeah. so the library just was the natural place to go. So. I wanted to ask you about this. Who made your fiddle? What's the story This is a French fiddle? fiddle and I don't know much about it. It comes from uh, Paris and the, the, na the maker is named Colin Maison. Uh, turn of the century, we've got to all train ourselves to say yeah. turn of the last century. Oh yeah, that's a good point. Uh, yeah. And so turn of the last century. Right. 1895, and, not 1995. And I used to have another French fiddle, too, but I sold it, so. Mm -hmm. But I love the sound of French how many, fiddles. Uh, how many fiddles in the collection? In, in, in your collection? I'm down to one. Really? Yeah. Not even a backup? Just not even a backup. It's kind of scary. Mm. Am I flirting with trouble? Uh -huh. I had two, but I kept leaving one behind. But my wife, now that we've got the kids out of the house, oh, yeah. uh, comes with me, so then I worry about leaving it behind. And, Good point. Uh, so the wife or the fiddle? No, I, well, no, I worry about leaving the fiddle behind. Okay, good. The right. wife is safe, but the fiddle yeah. is in okay. danger. So, right. uh, so, uh, <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, uh, I'm down to just That's this fiddle, amazing. and this is the fiddle that I was given by my parents when I moved from three-quarter size to full size. Wow. So I've lived with this fiddle even longer than my wife. Wow. Uh, <laughs> more than 50 years. And every now and then, a new set of strings, and off you go. Every now and then, a new set of potter strings, and then off I go again. Uh, ah, yes. It's, fiddles are amazing. They look so delicate and fragile, and yet you beat the dickens out of them, playing away energetically. Speaking of beating the dickens out of them, why don't you take us out with a tune? What are you, okay, you going to play? What's but it? I won't play a beating the dickens out no, tune. No. I want to play a sweet, slow tune. A waltz? Here's a, a waltz that Henry Reed knew but didn't teach me but his kids taught it to me okay they said oh don't don't you know this tune uh and i said no i don't and they said well daddy used to play it for us and so i learned it from his kids and, that's close uh, enough to the source so it's a All great right. great tune and a great waltz